Hi class, I hope you are having a fantastic day. Today we are going to learn about chapter 10, section one, Jefferson, Jeffersonian democracy. So before we learned that the Federalists dominated politics under the presidency of John Adams. And today our focus uh, is on Jefferson. And we are going to learn that after a tied election, Jefferson became president and the Democratic Republicans reduced the power of the federal government. Here is the vocabulary, so you can pause the video and uh, write down these vocab terms. So a new party comes to power. It's the election of 1800. This election was a contest between two parties with different ideas about the role of government. So this is the same chart that we used in the last chapter, chapter nine, to look at the difference between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. So if you wanna just pause the video, I just to refresh your memory of the biggest differences. So we have the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists are led by President John Adams. And they thought the nation was going to be ruined by these radicals, people who take extreme political positions. And that's how they viewed the Democratic Republicans. Now, the Democratic Republicans, on the other hand, uh, were led by Thomas Jefferson, and they thought they were saving the nation from monarchy and oppression. They wanted more rich people, a limited national government, and they did not like uh, the direction that the Federalists were taking the country. They also argued that the Alien and Sedition Acts violated the Bill of Rights. And we looked at that last chapter as well. So the Democratic Republicans won the presidency. Jefferson received 73 votes in the Electoral College and Adams won only 65 votes. Now Adams personally really did enjoy uh, being president. He even made the comment that uh, he won't really congratulate his friend if he became president because it's such you know a hard job. But he did not want the Democrat Republicans, Jefferson, uh, to have the job as president, so he decided to run again, but that failed, and the Democratic Republicans were uh, voted into office. But here's the thing. Jefferson was not the only candidate to receive 73 votes. So did Aaron Burr. So they are both Democratic Republicans. Well, now what do we do? The Constitution states that when there needs to be uh, a tiebreaker, the vote goes to the House of Representatives. Now remember, who is in control of the House of Representatives? But the Federalists, the opposite party. Well, now the Federalists are kind of stuck. They don't know who to vote for because they have to pick one of the guys from the opposite party. So what do we do? Jefferson or Burr? Some people knew they were going to vote for Burr because they were so afraid of Jefferson. Uh, but again, it was split. The, uh, when they did the tiebreaker, everyone, you know, they, uh, they voted. And guess what? Still a tie. So they had to vote again. Still another tie between Jefferson and Burr. Take another vote. Still a tie. So this one went on and on, you know, keep, uh, they kept doing these tiebreakers, but, but no one won. So Alexander Hamilton, uh, he played a role in this presidential election because even though he was the same party as Adams, he ended up writing, uh, writing down like all these reasons why Adams should not be the president and uh, Burr actually got a hold of this and it was published. And it made Adams look bad, but also made Burr look bad. Excuse me, it made uh, Hamilton look bad as well, because uh, he's the one who wrote this. And they thought, yeah, he's not capable of holding a high office as well. Well, Hamilton also puts his finger in uh, this tiebreaker between Jefferson and Burr. And Hamilton does not like Jefferson, but he doesn't like Burr even more. Uh, so he tries to convince the House of Representatives to vote for Jefferson instead of Burr. Uh, he even has his friend James A. Bayard uh, persuade some Federalists not to vote for Burr. So after 
35 ballots of trying to break this tie over seven days, still no tie. But finally, on the 36th vote, Jefferson had more uh, votes than Burr, and so Jefferson became the president of the United States. Now, it's also said that uh, Jefferson told uh, representatives that if he was voted for, that some of the Federalists that have federal jobs, uh, jobs in the national government, he would keep them in there. So some people say, you know, he was wheeling and dealing and, you know, and made that deal that if you vote for me, I'll keep you in your job, you know, some of the uh, government officials. So sure enough, uh, Jefferson becomes president on the 36th ballot and uh, Burr became his vice president. And Jefferson basically told Burr, you can just kind of leave me alone, you know, and, uh, you know, not be involved too much with uh, Jefferson's policies. So here's pictures. You have Burr on the left and Jefferson on the right. So the key question uh, that we're reviewing, our key question was, how was the presidential election resolved? And things that you can think about to answer this question. Uh, Federalist fear of radicals in government. Jefferson and Burr received 73 votes, Adam uh, 65, and Hamilton convinced Federalists in the House to vote for Jefferson. So there's some clues to be able to answer the question, uh, how was the presidential election resolved? So now let's take a look at Jefferson. And our key question is, how did Jefferson's policies different, differ from those of the Federalists? So we'll start with uh, Jefferson urged political enemies to unite as Americans in his inaugural address. He actually says, you know, we're all Federalists, we're all Democrat Republicans, and let's come together. He wanted the U.S. to remain a nation of small, independent farmers. He did not want the United States to become like uh, Great Britain and have factories. Uh, he wanted small, independent farmers to rule the U.S., you know, it will, you know to, uh, to cover the U.S. He wanted to avoid having too much government, and he did limit uh, the power of the government by reducing the number of federal employees, and he reduced the size of the military as well. Uh, he also sought to end uh, Federalist programs. Congress, controlled uh, by the Democratic Republicans, let the Alien Sedition Act expire, so they stopped that. Uh, we knew that Jefferson was not a fan of them. Of them. Uh, and Jefferson released prisoners convicted under these acts. So Alien Sedition Acts, done, okay? Uh, Congress also ended the unpopular whiskey tax that gave us problems in the past. He used money from tariffs and land sales to reduce the amount of money owed by the government. So he reduced the national debt. Now, the opposite party, Hamilton, thought that there should be a national debt because he thought if wealthy men are owed money by the government, they want to make sure they get their money back, so they're going to make sure that the government succeeds. Uh, and so he thought, you know, they'll make sure that the U.S. government is going well, you know, uh, but Jefferson thought, no, I don't want a high debt, and he reduced the debt. Jefferson is also interesting uh, because he tells people, he encourages people to write to him, and he says, you just have to pay for the paper and the ink when it comes uh, to the White House, we will pay for, the, you know, we'll pay for the postage. You don't have to worry about that. And Jefferson, even though he had a secretary, he insisted that he open every letter and he wrote back. And it's very interesting. Uh, Jefferson did not throw anything away. So we have these letters that people wrote to him and some of them are asking for money, which he actually did send some money uh, to them. He, some asked for jobs, uh, some criticized him and said that, you know, just uh, kind of bashed him and those he didn't write back to. Uh, but it's very interesting, but you can see these copies of the letters that people wrote the president. And he, and he wrote them back, which is pretty cool. So finally, uh, we're going to look at Jefferson democracy conflicts with the courts. Now, Adams, when he was president, he appointed as many federal judges as possible between the election of 1800 and Jefferson's inauguration. And this was made possible uh, through the Judiciary Acts of 1801, also known as the Midnight Judges Act. So basically what you have happening 
Uh, Adams knows that he is not going to be president anymore, uh, but he also knows uh, that judges are in there for life. So he stacks the courts. He's putting in so many Federalist judges, you know, because he doesn't want the Democrat, Repu Democratic Republicans having all this power. So he's just loading uh, the courts with uh, Federalists, with Federalist judges. So the Supreme Court judges are appointed for life, and so the Federalists, you know, would control the courts. Under Chief Justice John Marshall, the Supreme Court upheld federal authority and strengthened the federal courts. In 1803, in Marbury v. Madison, Marshall affirmed the principle of judicial review. And we're going to look at this court case. If you go to the class website, uh, you'll have information on Mar Marbury v. Madison. But the main uh, point of Marbury v. Madison is that I... Uh, the idea of judicial review, that the Supreme Court gets to say if a law uh, violates the U.S. Constitution or not, okay? So, and then our last thing here is judicial review, the final authority of the Supreme Court on the meaning of the Constitution. And we'll see that before that, the Supreme Court didn't have, you know, that equal power, the checks and balances uh, with the other two branches, uh, Congress and the executive branch. But through this uh, court case, the Supreme Court gave themselves, you know, that power to say, no, we're, we have the final say to see if this law is constitutional. All right. Well, thanks for joining in and I look forward to seeing you in class.